do respiratory fun stuff going on today. Inhalers, everybody likes those, right? Okay, uh, let's do a couple of questions, test question examples quick. So first one, uh, for the lecture we uh, I recorded last week, there's a immune system related question about um, uh, immune suppressive regimens. You have a 56 year old male, chronic heart failure, recently got a heart transplant, he's recovering from surgery, and it's time to start a maintenance regimen in order to prevent rejection. Which one of these combinations is most appropriate? So I'll give you a hint, prednisones in all of them. Uh, it's actually B is the correct answer. So, uh, <laughs> so, so your two anti-metabolite options, so your prednisone's, of course, out in all of them. Your two anti-metabolite options are azathioprine and mycophenolate, and your two calcineurin inhibitors are cyclosporin and TAC. So it has to be one of each of those. Uh, but anytime you see a MAB for a continuing regimen, that's automatically wrong. Those are only used for induction or acute rejection. So that's really all I want you to know about them in this respect for transplant. All right, uh, glaucoma. So here's a little background. You got a patient. She's a 67-year-old female. Presents to your clinic for an annual physical. She feels well. Has been having restricted vision. Um, reported symptoms uh, are mild glaucoma, and she, you suggest she files or uh, follows up with an ophthalmologist. However, you want to start her on something today. She is on the following medications. So I don't expect you to really know what these are yet. Some of them might sound familiar but uh, I told you what they're used for. So what's something that sticks out to you based on the glaucoma lecture thing? What do we sometimes get worried about when we give people certain types of glaucoma drugs? Theoretically. So I didn't, did I tell you what color her eyes are? No, I don't think I did. So assume that doesn't matter at this point. <laughs> That's a good point though. <laughs> <laughs> so remember with anything that's affecting the sympathetic nervous system, the idea is over time the, the drops can cause a systemic additive effect. So anytime somebody has, I think, like heart, different heart issues, that would be maybe a little bit of a red flag. We don't want to compound the effects because generally, I mean, we haven't talked about beta blockers a lot yet, but um, if you overdo them, it's not a good situation. And if somebody's already on 100 milligrams or so, which again, the dose doesn't really matter, but you assume that they're being managed properly at this point. So you probably don't want to overdo it and cause them to get bradycardic or hypotensive, and things like that. So maybe think about that going into the next question. So which would be the best option to start today? And if I don't tell you anything about eye color, you can assume that they don't care about their eye color. <laughs> They want to just take a, a stab at it. So what kind of drug is B? What drugs end in O-L-O-L? -L? <laughs> the wrong ones. Uh, the beta blocker. So that's a beta blocker. So again, that's probably what you wouldn't want to do with her. I mean, it's a little bit theoretical, but this is just more of an expert recommendation. Not my expertise, but people who do this more than me. Um, but the idea is, is that, you, again, you don't want to compound the effects of her existing beta blocker regimen if you can avoid it. Most people, when they're on a beta blocker, they usually only get to a certain dose with it because it causes a lot of bradycardia. And if you push it higher than that, the person will get so symptomatic that they won't tolerate it. So we don't want to do that to her. So that leaves, basically, you've got two first lines that you want to look at for glaucoma patients. One is going to be prostaglandins for almost every patient, unless, of course, they're going to fight you over their blue eyes and they're really scared about that, you know, small-ish percent chance. Uh, but if they can't see very well, they probably should use it anyway. That's my professional opinion on that. But anyway, um, then the second option would be a beta blocker. So for her, I didn't tell you anything about eye color. Um, I gave you some history, cardiac history. I would say that's a red flag for the beta blocker. So I would push towards a prostaglandin, which, anybody tell me which one's the prostaglandin? A. A is the prostaglandin. So it ends in prost, right? Not, not too hard. <laughs> Once you get the, the, the suffixes down, all the drugs are the same in the class. They all work the same, so it doesn't really matter which one it is as long as you can recognize it's an eye drop, which 
I'm not going to tell you a non-eye drop on an eye drop question. I'm not that mean. Or if I do, it'll be like acetazolamide orally or something. I'll make it very specific. Um, but And then beta blockers all end in LOL. So that's another easy one to recognize and remember. Um, dorazolamide plus timolol, that's a combination product. Usually you wouldn't start somebody on a combo product. I'd always start with one agent, and then you could add the combo or, or try the combo later if you wanted to change therapy. Olipatidine is a antihistamine, so that would be for allergies, symptomatic use only, not for glaucoma. They could have the same thing going on, but not what we're talking about for this question. Uh, possible side effects with each agent. So uh, we'll just go through this. So we talked about, uh, mat this is a little matching, so you can think about this a little bit, but I kind of have said all this. We talked about the cardiac effects with the um, beta blockers, so that goes with choice B. And I wouldn't ask you a matching test question. This is just something I thought that was creative, which probably makes you guys confused. But, but here we go. Um, what, what drug can cause orthostatic hypotension? Anybody have any idea which one might cause that? I kind of mentioned it in the lecture. You're going to have to know this for cards well, so it's good to have a little bit of it now. B. Uh, beta blocker could potentially, the ones that are really associated with it are, are alpha blockers. So... Um, like, uh, I didn't give you one specifically, but uh, that would be something to think about just with the, the alpha blocker class of medications that are used for glaucoma. Um, brown discoloration of the iris, we talked about that, prostaglandins, fixed small pupils, that'd be associated with cholinergic medications, which again, I don't have one of them up here right now. But just to go through and think about the most common side effects with each major class for glaucoma, and those would be the ones I'm most concerned about for each one. So if you can go through the lecture and take those four side effects away from those four classes, you're, you're pretty in pretty good shape as far as side effect profiles go. Again, it's eye drops. The odds of people actually getting significant side effects from them, I think it's pretty rare, but it's still kind of a recommendation that it could happen. So anyway, um, does anybody have any questions or want to review any of the topics from the last lecture before we go on to inhalers? Okay. Um, if you guys want to talk about some stuff after the uh, lecture, I, I think we'll have a little bit of extra time today. We'll see. I don't think this will take me the whole time. So anyway, uh, inhalers is what we're here to talk about and respiratory guidelines and things like that. Uh, I like respiratory medicine. I think it's it's fairly straightforward. And the great thing about it is it doesn't cause a lot of systemic side effects because most of the medications are inhaled. They go to the lungs. And for the most part, they stay in the lungs. So you don't really have to worry about comorbidities or drug interactions. There are some things out there, yes, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward, which is nice, especially when we're dealing with pediatric populations or if you're treating a pregnant patient or something like that, you just don't have to worry about as much of the exposure and how it's going to affect development, things of that nature. So um, there's a couple different kinds of inhalers on the market. There are three. Two of them are really common, and the, the third one's kind of a new one. So the meter dose inhaler, I'm going to see if this little thing works. I don't know if this camera actually does anything. I think I used it one year. This thing actually do something. I don't know. I probably just broke it. It's okay. You guys can see, right? Um, you can Google these if you want to look at images of them, and you can come up and look at them at the break too. So this is a oh, meter dose inhaler. Let's talk about that first. So this is a meter dose inhaler. This is like your standard albuterol inhaler, rescue inhaler. It's got a aerosol cartridge that kind of pops out of the actual inhaler housing here. This is a test one, so there's no actual drug in here. It's actually called placebo, in case you're wondering. And the they all sort of look the same. This is a, a very basic inhaler design. And the purpose of it has a couple things. So first of all, there's a mouthpiece that caps it so it keeps junk from getting into it. Um, certainly, you could spray it into your mouth like this if you wanted to. Not going to do anything different. This is just for convenience. Um, and then there's a little window in the back that has a dose counter on it, so it tells you how much is left on it. So that's a nice thing to do. If you, so some of these, like a rescue inhaler, like this isn't really all that helpful for compliance. Although if they bring you a rescue inhaler back and there's zero on here and you just gave it to them a week ago, you're like, yeah, you're using way too much of that, right? Because there's 200 actuations in here. That's a lot. Um, but like a Elipta, for example might have just a 28-day supply in it. So if they come back and you're like, oh, have you been in compliance with your inhalers? Can you show me your Elipta? And they give it to you and you prescribe it to them a month ago and there's 10 doses left on this big window here, then you're like, oh, what did you do for those 10 days and why haven't you been using it every day? So it's nice, actually, you can see 
I mean, you can monitor pillboxes and stuff like that for oral meds, but inhalers are sort of foolproof from that way. I mean, sure, the person could cheat, but why would somebody do that, right? Patients would never do that. Uh, but <laughs> but um, the meter dose inhaler is a vapor mist, sort of, so it kind of sprays out like that. You can't see it. And I'll talk about the, uh, the way that that uh, should be inhaled here in a second for compliance reasons. The other one are dry powdered inhalers, which these are examples of. So this Ellipta products kind of look like this. They have a window that opens up, it clicks, and then they just inhale. It's a one-step process. It's a nice big um, piece of plastic. So if you think about people who are older of diabetes or weak in grip, it's, it's easier to manipulate, I think, than, than this, which is a discus. And discuses were the first marketed dry powders inhalers out there that were really popular. So like Advair, for example, came out as a discus first. And you actually click it back, and then you have to push this thing and open a window, which exposes the medication, and then inhale. So it's a two-step process. It's a little bit clunky. This is nice and streamlined. Glaxo makes both, or I don't know if they still make this or if they just gave up on it and now are just making this. But so it's the same drug company that does all this stuff. So it's not like one co competitor came out and like they basically outdid themselves, right? So um, we switched over to these, and the other reason is most of these products are all once daily, whereas like an Advair is a twice a day dose, and I'll talk about that stuff later. But the point is, is that what happens in here is it opens up this window, which gives you a dry powder that you inhale then um, directly from the inhaler. So it doesn't propel anything out. You actually have to pull it out. And so the major difference between these two, and I'll show you videos, but just for sake of discussion, a uh, slow, deep breath with a vapor product and a fast um, uh, well, slow, slow and deep, and then fast and deep would be the bit different. So when you're inhaling this, you're inhaling it really fast. And this one, you're kind of just like over time. Whereas this one, you'll hear people just go like very fast inhalation because you want that powder to get to the back of the, not the back of the throat, but to get into the lungs, right? You, if you inhale it too slowly, it can stick in the mouth. It can stick to the back of the throat. So the faster you inhale it, the more likelihood it gets straight into the lungs that way. That's the major difference from an adherence standpoint, but I'll show you some videos about that just to reinforce that. I'm sure you guys have talked to a respiratory therapist at some point as well in this curriculum, but I don't think it's bad to get this a couple times. So, uh, I've heard mixed reviews about that, by the way. <laughs> Maybe it's gotten better, but um, some person told me not so good things about it. Anyway, um, here's, a, here's all the instructions on how you should actually do it so if you want to read through it let's watch a video you know i used to have this funnier video for mdis but it's not on youtube anymore so i'm going to pick a random one and we'll hope, we'll hope it works out this is 10 minutes i don't think we need 10 minutes to talk about this but we'll see uh-oh do i want to save money is this a trick question all right we'll mute that for a second um Oh, the other one is the soft mist inhaler, which is very similar to a meter dose inhaler. It's just a little bit of a different propellant delivery system, but similar in how it's actually inhaled. There's a, I have a, the Steel Toe is the brand name of it. It's a newer product. I've actually never seen one in real life, so they aren't real common. I think they're more expensive. Um, the dry powder and the meter dose are by far the more common ones. Okay. Let's watch this. I'm registered nurse RN.com, and in this video, I'm going to demonstrate for you sound. how to use a near dose inhaler uh, using both an open mouth and closed mouth technique. So, what is a meter dose? All right, let me see if I can just do it with well, looking at her pictures here. Okay. I can't listen to that. All right, this is the one thing I remember. Not, not because of her, because of its garbled. I'm sorry, that was sounded mean. Um, so she's got a spacer there, and I didn't bring a spacer with me, but a spacer is basically like a big thing that allows you to squeeze it into a space and then inhale it from there. The idea is that the spacer allows you to control the medication where it goes, whereas if you're trying to inhale it, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to control the delivery of the drug and it can shoot out. You might lose some to the air, which is fine. Uh, but a spacer makes it a lot easier to, to do that slow inhalation um, with keeping the drug in the same space. And so you see different ones. This is a nicer spacer that she's got here. It's bigger, and it's got a, a better mouthpiece on it. The ones we give people at the hospital are like these little tubes that look like a, a toilet paper roll made out of plastic. And it does the same thing, but still. The only ones I'd really avoid are ones that are corrugated on the inside. So if they have a lot of surface area inside, that could mean that the drug just ends up sticking in there, and it might not be as effective or get into the lungs completely. So just my, my two cents on there. I don't know if there's anything else really worth talking about with them. They're, it's pretty straightforward. Again, 
Uh, slow deep breath is the big thing here. All right, this lady's uh, got a, she's a little entertaining here. Not quite as dry. There are many kinds of inhaled medications oh, that are. Uh, speakers are just the. Let me try a lower volume. They're called dry powder inhalers, and it's important for you to know if you or your child is well, taking a dry powder inhaler, ass. how to use it. You use it a little bit differently than you use wet inhaled medicines like I showed you before. This is one example of a dry powder inhaler, and with all of these, they have a slightly different mechanism for loading, but there's some way that you load the dose, and in this case with Advair, I open it up to show the mouthpiece, and I have a little trigger that I cock that opens a window where the medicine is stored. This dry powder inhaler has a dose counter, which is handy because it helps you keep track and make sure you never run out of medication. It's so important that you not run out of your child's asthma controller medicine, and it's very easy to request refills. Go to the contact section of this website to the pharmacy refill request section, and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can ask us to get more medicine to help you control your child's asthma. All of these types of dry powder inhalers are controller medicines that you have to take regularly. Never reach for them in an asthmatic attack, but you always should remember to try to take them as part of your daily routine. Because Dr. B has asthma, I take this medication every single day, and I wanted to show you how to use it correctly. Speed is the most important part of taking this medicine because it's a dry powder. It will stick on whatever surface it first hits, whether that's your tongue, or if your mouth, or hopefully if it is your lungs. So when you use this, I always tell kids it's sort of like holding a hamburger. You want to hold it flat. If you tip it towards the floor, all the medicine that you just paid for is going to fall on your toes. So instead, hold it flat like a hamburger, and then I'm going to show you how I empty my lungs. I put this in my mouth, and for me, it works much better if I plug my nose so that I am only inhaling through my mouth and really getting this deeply into my lungs when I take a, a puff. All right, so I'm going to empty my lungs, put it in my mouth, and seal my lips. And then the most important thing after you take any type She's got of good care, technique. you need to take some water, and if your child is old enough, they need to swish it and spit it out. The purpose of spitting out the medicine is so that anything that's left inside your child's mouth is gone, rinsed away, so that it doesn't cause thrush or cause sore throat. So that's also an important thing as well. We'll talk about that in a second, but it's a, a lot of times, depends on what your dry powdered medication is, but you should always try and rinse it out. But if it's a corticosteroid, which is usually what the inhaled ones are, or their combination that includes a corticosteroid, that's what's going to cause maybe a local suppressed immune system response, and over time that can lead to things like thrush. All right. That's technique. And then the SMIs, again, I don't really see, you'll see these branded as respomats. Uh, by the company that makes them, and I, I don't really have much else to say about them. Like I said, they're kind of an advanced MDI using a different propellant. They last a little bit longer, um, whereas most, a lot of basic MDIs are short, used for short-acting meds. Um, only a couple out there are for longer ones, longer-acting ones, but they're getting better, and there's actually a lot of different options out there for people now. But anyway, this is just the second one. Um, some of their trials say that it's better, more efficient drug, drug delivery, and people are more adherent with this type. But I really think it's it's all about the design of the inhaler and how convenient it is to use versus necessarily the actually what what is in the inhaler. But um, that's my personal opinion on that one. Okay, let's talk about the actual drugs. So uh, we'll start with short-acting medications and then move our way to longer ones. So short-acting beta <laughs> agonist or Asaba. It's really our mainstay of treatment for any acute symptoms. And what they're going to do is work on the beta-2 receptors in the lungs to relax the smooth muscle. And you do get some cardiac side effects, potentially, because this is probably the one 
Uh, like if you, albuterol is probably the one drug that I think of that actually does cause quite a bit of tachycardia if you give it to somebody in pretty heavy amounts. And it's usually short-lived. It's not fast-acting on the heart receptors. It's somewhat beta-2 selective, but once it gets absorbed through the pulmonary vasculature into systemic circulation, you will get some cardiac side effects with it. It's usually not a big deal, uh, but just know if somebody is having an asthma attack, they're probably already anxious and tachycardic to begin with. Could end up getting more so, but it's not a reason to withhold therapy or anything. Um, albuterol is the older drug. It's the more common one. It's cheap. Uh, inhalers are all pretty expensive, like an uh, advert or a, um, a, an Ellipta product, a discus product or an Ellipta product are probably at least a couple hundred bucks cash price, probably looking at more like $300 per inhaler. You can get an Adver inhaler, or, uh, sorry, an albuterol inhaler for 20 bucks, 30 bucks, a little bit cheaper. You always have to think of that this is a lot more complicated to manufacture than a pill, right? So the fact that it costs a little bit more isn't totally surprising, but that's the way it is. Some of these inhalers are really expensive, and I'll talk about that here in a second. I always get the question from providers, like, what is the cheapest option for fluticasone? And, like, there isn't one. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, anyway, back to these ones. Albuterol and levalbuterol is the enantiomer of it. Um, levalbuterol is brand name Zopenex. I don't have it on there, but it's spelled with an X. X-O-P-E-N-E-X. -E -E and it's remarketed product that works really the same way as albuterol and people just take it because it supposedly has less cardiac reaction to it. No clinical trial has really proven that, but some people claim they get so jittery when they use albuterol that they have to use leave albuterol. This has been a notorious thing that pharmacists hate because it was so expensive for a long time and insurances didn't pay for it. It wasn't on hospital formularies. I think for the most part, Zopinex is generic now, so it shouldn't be as expensive as it used to be. But just know that a Zopinex inhaler or a leave albuterol generic inhaler even is probably going to be quite a bit more money than an albuterol inhaler. So take that into consideration. Um, ultimately, these are short-acting medications not recommended for regular use. These are what people call rescue inhalers, and they should be used for that. If somebody's using their albuterol or leave albuterol five, six times a day, that's a sign that they aren't well managed. They should be on something different than that or on a different controlling medication. That's a sign to use the provider to look into why they're using that so much. Um, frequency of use, how much you're using is directly correlated with how severe your asthma or COPD is too. So there is good data to back that up that those two things correlate, which makes sense. Okay, long-acting beta agonists work the same way, same concept, but it sticks around in the lungs longer. So you have salmeterol, which is Cerevent as a standard discus. It comes as this plain product. Um, it's also part of Advair, so it's um, as a combo product too. It's got a two-hour onset and about a 12-hour duration, so it's a twice-a-day in in inhaled medication. Uh, Formoterol is there as well. It's part of a couple different combinations, Simbicort and Dulera, which we'll talk about the combos here in a second because they're really popular choices for people. Um, our Formoterol is Brovana, which is a nebulizer, and I haven't talked about nebs yet. I can't remember if I have a neb video on here or not, if I talk about that during PEDS. I might have that on PEDS, but um, nebulizer machines are, you guys, some of you guys have probably seen a neb machine before. Have you guys gotten to play with a neb machine in this group so far? So basically, it's it just, you put on a mask and you put fluid in a little thing that uh, nebulizes it so it becomes a vapor and then you breathe it in. The dosing is not an exact science because the vapor kind of escapes into the air a little bit too. Uh, but it's usually at higher concentrations and higher amounts than what you'd get in an inhaler. So, for example, I don't think I have albuterol's dose on here, but I don't know if you can see it. Most albuterols are 90 micrograms per inhalation. So every time you spray this, 90 micrograms of albuterol sprays out. A nebulizer is 2.5 milligrams of albuterol for an adult dose. So you can see the difference in that. If you sit and spend 10 minutes doing an albuterol neb, you're getting a lot more drug than you would if you just took a puff on this. So we'll talk about exacerbations here in a little bit, but I'll say this once and I'll say it again. If you have somebody at home, don't be afraid to tell them to use their inhaler five, ten times if they're having a feel like they're having an exacerbation. Because that's still not that much medication in the grand scheme of things. EMS might arrive and give them a lot more via nebulization at that point. So certainly it's an option if they can keep them out of their emergency room or the hospital for a little while longer. Uh, it's definitely worth a shot. So and um, feel free to use that a little bit more liberally. A lot of times it's dosed like one to two puffs as needed for wheezing or cough, but you can definitely go higher than that. All right, anyway, back to the long-acting ones. Um, Indicaterol, I've never seen that prescribed, so I don't know. It's, it's got a COPD-only indication. Don't worry about it. Um, there's a couple other ones that I'm just going to mention because they're part of combination therapies, so I don't really care that you know them by themselves. However, just be able to recognize that they are the beta 
uh, agonist component, and you should be able to um, realize that they're all the same ROL uh, ending here. Volanterol is a newer one that is only part of these Ellipta products. And you guys are going to think I'm an ad for Ellipta by the end of this because I really do kind of like these inhalers. But um, <laughs> it's, it's one of the first ones that came out that was once daily. So it allowed people to take a once daily inhalation, which anytime you can do once daily, it improves compliance. So that's always a good thing. Um, the the Indicaterol for COPD is also once daily, but again, no one really uses that anymore. Um, these should not be used acutely. There are some that have some fast onset. So for Motorol, for example, does have an acute onset. Still doesn't replace a short-acting rescue inhaler and shouldn't. So that's one thing to really educate people on because I, I still get people in the ER and I think people just do whatever they want and that, that's not something you're going to be able to change with everyone, right? But some people will just say, oh, I just take my Advair when I need it. It's like, that's just not helpful to do that. <laughs> Don't do it that way. Uh, but people do that anyway. Now, if they do their Simbacort emergently, they might be able to get some benefit out of that. So if they were having an asthma attack and they somehow switched them up and brought their Simbacort and not their albuterol and they needed to use it, sure, it's it's fine, but it's not the ideal way to do it. So ideally, this always stays with the patient, the, the fast-acting albuterol. They always should have access to that. Um, Long-acting beta agonists are contraindicated as monotherapy and asthma. They're a second-line option. You always start with, we'll talk about these guidelines too, we start with corticosteroids and asthmatic patients and then add on the uh, long-acting beta agonist. There's actually a, a, some evidence that says that if you use a long-acting beta agonist, as solo, you can have an increase in mortality risk with those patients. So we don't do that. COPD, you could. All right, uh, inhaled corticosteroids. So the second major class um, blocks late phase reaction to allergens, reduces airway hyperresponsiveness. You inhibit inflammatory cell migration. It's really our first line for asthma because that's all the processes that are usually causing asthma triggers for most patients. I talked about rinsing the mouth on the video, and, and I mentioned it too. Um, if you swallow the corticosteroid, so some reason you're like sucking it into your mouth and not inhaling it properly and just, just eating it basically, you're going to get some systemic absorption and that, that's possible. If it goes into the lungs, it should have very little uh, systemic side effects at all, if any. You really shouldn't have any of those side effects we talked about with respect to steroids. Um, it has no role in acute treatment. It usually takes a few days to work, just like the steroid nasal sprays I mentioned. And usually you're looking at a few weeks to see full benefit with inhaled corticosteroid. Some people recommend supplementing calcium. We talked about uh, steroids and osteoporosis risk. That's theoretical and there's no evidence to say that actually does anything. But if your patient was worried about it and they wanted to take a calcium supplement because they're worried about osteoporosis, sure, it's not going to hurt them. But there's not really any evidence to say that there's a risk that links those two things together. Okay, here's a bunch of the different steroids that are out there right now. Um, they all kind of sound the similarly or end in own, or there's this odd one, which I, again, this is not a really common one, so don't worry too much about cyclesin. I have never, I don't even know if I've ever seen that, uh, but it is uh, a commercially available one. A lot of these are in combination products too, which we're going to talk about. Fluticasone comes in a couple different salt forms. So like, for example, this one is fluticasone furoate Advair. I can't remember what it is, but it's different. <laughs> And um, that has to do with how long the, the drug lasts. So if they reformulate the fluticasone somewhat, uh, you can get a longer acting duration out of it. But um, fluticasone is fluticasone. It's still the same drug. It just might be formulated a little bit differently. So don't think that like Advair, fluticasone, and Brio or um, the Ellipta fluticasone is all that different. It's the same drug. It's just a little bit formulated differently. But fluticasone is by far and away the more, most common one you're going to see in the major products. All right. So here are combinations. So the long-acting beta agonist steroid combinations are probably the most popular drugs for respiratory disorders. And the uh, reason being is most guidelines recommend the combination at some point. They usually recommend starting with one and then adding, but a lot of times, depending on how severe your symptoms are to start with, you could go with a combo product right off the bat. Advair has been the most popular one for a decade or more. Uh, but there's some newer players on the market, and I think Simbacort and Dulera are both fairly commonly used. Um, Simbacort and Dulera are both uh, meter dose inhalers, and so not, not the dry powder technique. So if you have a patient who really hates that dry powder technique for some reason, or they just can't breathe deeply enough and it seems to always stick in their mouth and they can taste it and all this stuff, uh, maybe the, the meter dose with the spacer is the better option for them. So it's nice to have flexibility with the different products depending on your patient's adherence and what's going to work best for them. So just keep that in mind that not all of these, even though 
Um, the most common ones like Advair and the Brio products that are probably the most popular ones use are dry powder. You still have other options here too. And Symbicord is a pretty popular inhaler. Cost for cost, um, Elliptic products are the cheapest out there. We have these on formulary at the hospital for a reason because they're less expensive by like marginally so. But when you dispense hundreds of them a year, it makes up a pretty big difference. So um, yeah, they might save a few bucks if you switch them to something. But all in all, they're all fairly similar. You I mean you're talking about let's say around 300 bucks for an inhaler cash price. And most insurances will pay for them. You will get issues with prior authorizations and things like that saying you prescribe Symbicor and they say, no, we want to try Advair, we want to try Brio first, or whatever it may be. But, and I should say, I keep interchanging Brio and Elipta. So Elipta, you'll see Elipta on any inhaler that looks like this. Elipta and Discus are the brands of the mechanism device. So this is an Elipta. The drug in here is Brio. It's a little bit confusing. So I think that's Advair as a drug, the, the, the device, this is a discus. So I always get the question on why aren't inhalers generic and why are they still expensive? Because I believe, and from what I've read and understand, this delivery mechanism is patented in and of itself, and that's different than a drug patent. I don't know if it's a utility patent or how exactly it all works, to be honest, but the point is, is that um, you might not see a patent uh, on a new delivery device that's similar to this because the Glaxo owns the patent for delivering dry powder inhaler in a specific way with like a one-click device or something like that. So you see people get creative and try alternates, but that's a big reason why inhalers will probably be expensive for quite a while and you won't really see like a generic version of Advair come out because it's not really possible. The drugs are generic inside of it, sure, and you could make your own inhaler if you were a genius and could figure that out, but you'd still probably infringe on their patent if you tried to. So <laughs> good luck. Maybe one of you guys is, is much smarter than, than any of the rest of us and can get that done. <laughs> but it'd make a big difference. If somebody could kind of come on the market with a generic version that worked well, um, it would be a, a, a game changer for cost for a lot of these patients because they are pricey, pricey drugs. All right. Um, just to finish up corticosteroids, you can use systemic steroids, and it's really only in exacerbations or really poorly controlled um, symptoms. And we'll talk about where those fit in the guidelines. But generally, you're looking at an asthma or a COPD exacerbation, and it's a short course. So asthma, <clears throat> the big difference, I'm not going to test you on dose or duration, but just for your reference. Asthma is a higher dose, shorter duration, and COPD is usually a lo slightly lower dose, slightly longer duration. But you can see they cross in the middle at 10 days there. So, oh. You can give IV um, drugs like methylprednisolone, so um, a milligram of methylprednisolone, pretty similar to prednisone dose. Uh, so that's a good way to start somebody out in the emergency department or urgent care, give them IV, and then switch them to oral. Yeah? For like the long-acting stuff? Like should we know like there or I'll give you I'll give you the brand names for them for the for these specific ones. Yep. So you can know either one. You can know the combo or the brand. I think what I'll do is I'm not gonna test you I'm not gonna give you a choice between Adver or Dulera. Um, I don't expect you to care about the differences in that. That would really just come down to adherence or personal preference or insurance, and I'm not concerned for that from a test perspective. What I would give you is a, a guideline related question. So the patient started on just fluticasone alone and then they switch to whatever it might be, and then I'd give you choices for which one to add on. And one of those might be keep them on the fluticasone or as a combination product by adding like one of these. So basically changing them from plain fluticasone to fluticasone plus philanteral. So that'd be more of the question I'd ask you versus actually trying to get you to differentiate between these. You can assume for an exam purpose, they're all exactly the same. There's no evidence that says one's better than the other. They all work well. Okay, uh, that's all I really want to talk about corticosteroids and, and their burst use. Um, really, it's, it's a sustained uh, small burst you're going to give them, and then they should be, you shouldn't really even need to taper them off of it. You can usually just stop it cold turkey. Anticholinergics is the third major class. So these are going to reduce intrinsic vagal tone of the airway via muscarinic receptor inhibition. They decrease secretions. So smooth muscle relaxation really is what we're talking about here. So you hear long-acting beta agonists and anticholinergics put into the same boat because they kind of do the same thing. They relax the pulmonary smooth muscle. However, they do it by different mechanisms of action. So you can use them together synergistically and get additive effects. So don't think of them. Sometimes like the COPD guidelines calls them all bronchodilators. Well, that's a little bit simplified because they are different in how they work, but that is what they do basically. So if you read that, um, just know that that's a uh, thing. Um, COPD only, I put a question mark on here. I should probably just delete that, but I figure it's a good talking point. 
for a long time, anticholinergics were only for COPD from a long-acting perspective. So if you ever saw somebody on teotropium, you're like, oh, they're a COPD or, COPD -er versus an asthma. Um, asthma guidelines, I think in 2015 or 2014, were updated to add anticholinergics. And it makes sense. They're a bronchodilator. They work well. There's no reason why they couldn't have been used in asthma. And they were likely being used a lot clinically just off-label. But now the guidelines have actually adopted that. So that's been uh, been overturned, I guess. So if you see an anticholinergic, it might mean either one at this point, because I think they're widely used in both respiratory disorders. So really, we're using all the same drugs uh, so far in both disorders, but we'll talk about those little nuances with the guidelines here. Uh, okay, teotropium was the first drug that was a long-acting anticholinergic ca came out in brand name Spiriva. Spiriva was the only long-acting anticholinergic on the market for a lot of years, like maybe a decade or more. Um, so it was a huge blockbuster for, I can't remember what company had it. Uh, but now there's a couple other ones out there. So um, we'll talk about a few of these. There's ipotropium, which is not a long-acting one. So let's get that one out of the way first. It's a short-acting one that a lot of times people will take on its own. So brand name Atrovent by itself, and it kind of replaces albuterol as a rescue inhaler. It's short-acting. Every once in a while, I see people who take ipotropium chronically four times a day, but that's not really common and most patients aren't going to like that. I think the inhalers are not super expensive, so maybe it's a cost type thing. But overall, if you can get by with one of the long-acting ones, that's going to be preferred. Um, and also you'll see ipotropium combined with albuterol as um, the product either, uh, well, I can't remember the, the inhaler was called, but anyway, it's a combination rescue inhaler. It's not super common either. So no real advantage to using that in an emergency versus the uh, just plain albuterol for like somebody on the street. When they come into the hospital or the ambulance, combining them in a nebulizer form actually does have some benefit. You get both drugs and you, if you're having a really bad exacerbation enough to be in an ambulance, you should have as much respiratory care as possible. So they hit you with both drugs via nebulizer form. That drug's called Duoneb. So it's a combination between ipotropium and albuterol. And we'll talk about respiratory emergencies a little bit more. We'll come back to it during emergency medicine, but just so you guys know how this particular drug works. Because it's really not a chronic one that we see used a lot, but it falls into the anticholinergic category. Uh, acladinium is Tridoza, which is one of the first drugs that came out to challenge Spiriva. I don't see a lot of people on this, to be honest. And then I think this is called eumeclidinium, but I've never actually heard somebody say it correctly that I know of. So anyway, that's why I say it. Uh, but Incruis is the Ellipta product. So there's um, an Ellipta inhaler that's an Incruis brand, and that contains eumeclidinium as its anticholinergic. So Glaxo picked up an anticholinergic to compete against Spiriva. And so now there's a couple different competitors in the marketplace. And the cool thing is, is um, it took a long time to get here, but there's finally combination anticholinergic other products. So you get anticholinergic teotropium plus olodaterol, which is steolto, which is the, um, the soft mist inhaler that I have that link to. And then you have Anoro, which is a ellipta product that has eumeclidinium and volanterol as the saba in it, so two bronchodilators in it. And then recently, this just came out, Trelogy, which is a ellipta product. And that has fluticasone with uh, basically a neural plus fluticasone. So it actually has all three in it. And we'll talk about triple therapy here in a second. But um, for people on that, super convenient to carry one inhaler one time a day. Really nice. Yeah. Is it going to be important for us to be keeping track of all these that are ellipta or not? No. Or no, I don't, I don't care about the, okay. no. It's just when you, if you're looking at prescribing it, it might help to know like what the difference is if you're writing it into like a database to pull it up to see which options you have. But yeah, that's about it. Okay. No, from a test perspective, I don't care. Yes? Maybe I just missed it, but would there, there be a, like, what would be the reasoning for like, behind getting an ultra-trip Good question. We'll talk about that in a, in a few slides here. I'll, if I don't answer your question, bring it back up. Um, this just shows Spiriva and how it's used. So this is the reason I, I think Spiriva is a terrible design personally. So you have this thing that looks like an egg that opens up and then you have to actually open up this second piece. You take a capsule out of a blister pack, put the capsule in there, crush the capsule using this little trigger on the side that puts a spike through it, and then you inhale. So it's like, I don't know, six steps versus one. Uh, so there's a reason why people have probably gone away from this now that there's some alternatives on the market. And you imagine, again, somebody with diabetes, neuropathies, 
poor dexterity. They just can't manipulate that many things. Or you get somebody who doesn't understand it at all and takes the capsule orally and thinks they're doing it correctly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, this just shows the, uh, you guys, we've talked about this. Nebulizers. So I've got some videos on nebs here. I'm not going to watch them. Uh, you can watch them on your own if you want to. We won't spend any time with that. They're kind of funny. There's some kids that run around with nebs on. Um, very popular for patients who are pediatric patients. So that's an obvious one. Just kids who difficult. If I had to tell my son how to use an inhaler, there's no way he'd ever use it. But if I could strap a neb mask onto him and run it and he just breathes normally, that's the idea here. Um, if you had a disabled adult or um, an older elderly adult who's demented and can't do it, sometimes nebs are the better choice. Sometimes you'll see them for really severe, uncontrolled um, respiratory disorders. People might be on like four times a day duo nebs where they just take albuterol and epitropium around the clock uh, while they're awake. So that's an option. Definitely not ideal, but it is uh, something you'll see here and there. All right, let's talk about a couple more drugs, and we'll talk about take a quick break and come back and talk about the guidelines. So drugs that affect lipoxygenase. So I talked about these briefly, uh, or mentioned this concept briefly in the last lecture, but these drugs block the effects of leukotriene. So you get a variety of patient responses. Generally, these are used for almost exclusively for asthma, so it's sort of a second option in addition to inhalers. They're all oral, and they have a variety of products on the market. The one that's most common is Montelukast, which is a leukotriene receptor antagonist. It's brand name Singular. It's been generic for quite a while, but it's a really popular drug. Um, it's probably the first one that's added on for patients who, aren't, who are on inhalers and really not getting the full response. Um, some people think it, it improves if you have an allergic nature to your asthma reaction. So if you get seasonal asthma or asthma ramps up during certain um, seasons due to uh, allergy exposure, that could be a reason why, um, or, or uh, sorry, a pathophysiologic reason why that's happening. So that's why you're trying to block that side of things. Different mechanism of action than the way your inhalers are working, just overall different concepts. So certainly a good adjunct option for people. Um, Zafir Lucast or Accolate, similar concept. Uh, hasn't, I think it's still brand name, so probably more expensive. And then there's a specific enzyme inhibitor as opposed to a receptor antagonist that works on the enzyme itself to block it. And then that's called Xylutin or Zyflo, which is a twice a day product. So, yeah. The most common one by far and away is Montelukas. So know that these other ones exist, but I wouldn't be too worried about them from a practice point of view. I think there was a mention in one of our pulmonary lectures about um, possible side effects of singular as far as and or oh yeah, I've heard of the nightmares. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how like that was. I always think of it as pretty well tolerated. I think there is incidence of that. Why that happens, I, I have no answer. I think it's one of those things that people found out a lot later with the drug after case reports came out, and I don't know how widespread it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you generally like say much about it? Or... I don't know. I think you could mention it if you wanted to. I don't know what the incidence is off the top of my head, but I feel like it's fairly low. Uh, xanthine derivatives are not really commonly used, so we won't spend a ton of time on them. Most of their role would be in IV for as an IV product for an exacerbation that's not responding to anything else. I've rarely used xanthine derivatives before, but they do have uh, some functionality out there. Uh, there is some evidence for them in COPD exacerbation versus asthma use, but you could theoretically use them in both. And really a last line therapy. We have a lot of things in our kit we can use for an asthma exacerbation, but this would be something to try if nothing's working. But that's all I really want to talk about. So um, theophylline is fairly toxic. It's not something that's great to take chronically, although it does come orally and you will see people occasionally on it for severe COPD. They'll take it three three times a day around the clock, but it's a, it'd be a, a far down the line option once you've kind of maximized your inhalers. Um, Aminophilin is a different subtype of it that's more of an IV only product and really kind of interchangeable. And then caffeine I just put down there because it is a methyl xanthine and it does have a similar mechanism of action. Um, they can be used in for some pediatric indications we'll talk about uh, uh, during the PEDS lectures. So no, no, nothing on that on the exam, so don't worry about caffeine. And then finally, uh, Zolaire or omelizumab is a monoclonal antibody that inhibits IgE binding on mast cells and basophils. So you're getting a limited activation and release during allergic response. 
and it's indicated for severe allergic asthma for people who aren't ab either able to take inhalers or not responding well to them, or it's really you've got it nailed down to this is an allergic asthma response, and that's really the only trigger this person has. It's sub-Q dosing every four weeks. It's weight-based, uh, based on pretreatment IgE levels in the body. Um, hasn't been studied in kids less than 12 years old, but it might be used sometimes for pediatric use off-label. One hour to one year delayed onset anaphylaxis can occur, which is funny because it's kind of trying to prevent that, right? But any monoclonal antibody, again, has a high, high-ish risk of causing that. Uh, most occurred less than 60 minutes within the first or second dose. So if you give somebody a dose of this, they have to be usually in a clinic setting where they could get immediate access to care or a hospital setting even. It's expensive too. So this would be something to talk about with the patient, but it might not be the best option for everyone for obvious reasons. So. All right. We'll take a quick break. Let's come back at, I don't know, why don't you come back at 425 or so, and we'll continue with the guidelines. Keep going. We can probably get through this in the next, by five, I would think, and give you some time back or go through some review stuff if you want. Uh, so let's talk about asthma. The asthma guideline website is up here. It's the Global Initiative for Asthma, or GINA, um, if you want to abbreviate it. And all right, uh, so basics of asthma, chronic inflammatory disorder, uh, waxing and waning airflow obstruction affects about 7% of the U.S. population. It's the most common childhood illness. So if you do peds, you're going to see a lot of asthma, but certainly any type of practice, you'll probably see it at some point. Um, responsible for a lot of emergency department visits and hospitalizations, regardless of what patient population you work with. So prevention is key, and we can really limit that number if we're managing appropriately on the outpatient side of things. Um, death is quite rare from an asthma exacerbation, and it's highly preventable and very easily treatable if gotten to in time. So. Asthma in your airways, you guys know this stuff. I'll just keep going. Okay. Constriction. Uh, asthma, <laughs> asthma triggers. So you're like, you can skip over all your stuff. But yeah, you guys, you guys know pathophys. Somebody else teaches that. <laughs> uh, not my cup of tea. Anyway, uh, asthma triggers, household allergens. So tobacco smoke, wood burning stoves, chemicals um, can all be triggers. Pets, mold, dust mites, cockroaches, and rodents, any types of those environments possibly increase the risk of asthma and the, the more frequently you get a trigger. Workplace specific, if you work in like an industrial laboratory or something, possibly, or maybe a pet shop, I don't know. Probably shouldn't work in a pet shop if you're allergic to cats, but you know, you never know. Some people might not be able to stay away. Um, <laughs> outdoor allergens, so trees in the spring, grasses in the spring, weeds, summer, autumn. So depending on what you're allergic to, you probably know your body and how you responded to symptoms and when you are more likely to act up. So that might be a possibility too. Um, other medical conditions, allergic rhinitis, um, causing post-nasal drip. Uh, GERD, aspiration of food chronically can actually cause asthmatic-like symptoms. Medications such as beta blockers and NSAIDs may prevent certain issues. So, like um, we talked, to, I talked to mention briefly beta blockers and the asthma correlation. If you think about it, you're blocking beta receptors and you give a beta agonist to try and overcome that. That's the issue there. It's not like beta blockers actually cause asthma, but they can prevent your local, your endogenous ability to. Um, bronchodilate, and it can also prevent medications from working as effectively. So that's the issue there. Um, NSAIDs just can cut down on the general amount of um, positive or housekeeping prostaglandins and things like that. They can help vasodilate, so you actually might get some vasoconstriction more naturally if you take NSAIDs chronically. And NSAIDs like ibuprofen or naproxen, Aleve, Advil, those common uh, over-the-counter pain medications. Not really contraindications to using those in people, so I want to make that clear, but there would be maybe a little precaution there. Uh, goal of therapy, we want to reduce impairment uh, from intensity and frequency of symptoms, freedom from cough, chest, chest tightness, wheezing, shortness of breath, sleep disturbances. Uh, those are the most common things people are going to experience if they come into, and those are the, the markers we're looking at, surrogate markers we're looking at for how their disease is progressing. Minimal use of rescue medications, that's another big thing we're looking at. Less than two times per week is ideal. Um, ide well, ideally none, but uh, less than two times per week is generally considered okay. Uh, optimize your lung function, so pulmonary function testing, pulmonary rehabilitation, stuff like that that I'm not going to go into. It. I don't really know all that much about, but those are options. Uh, maintain normal daily activities. So can the patient still go to work and school okay? Can they function? Can they play sports? Can they be part of athletic programs without any issue? Those are big deals for, for people and kids, for sure. Uh, reduce risk. So prevent your ER visits. Reduce uh, Prevent and reduce lung growth and development, which can happen for pediatric patients who have asthma. And uh, prevent pharmacologic, pharmacologic adverse effects, of course, which... 
usually minimal, but definitely worth mentioning. Uh, so this just talks about symptom severity and some of the stuff we talked about, how the guidelines will break it down as far as what's considered intermittent asthma versus more severe than that. So intermittent asthma would be the best type of asthma. So if you're diagnosed with asthma, you either have it or you don't. And if you have it, intermittent is good. It means most of your symptoms are under control with respect to, to these metrics here. Uh, then you have persistent asthma, which categorizes as mild, moderate, or severe. And depending on where it falls into onto this chart is basically where you treat. So I'm going to show you a couple different diagrams here. These diagrams are a little bit older, and they're from guidelines that are no longer published in this format. The GINA guidelines, I'm going to show you that algorithm too, but it's pretty much the same. I just like the way this is laid out. I think it looks cleaner, and I don't really think it's changed all that much. Uh, from what I've read. So anyway, this is how they categorize this. I'm not too concerned you know this, but it is important to be able to stage a patient to know what to put them on. So if I give you symptoms that are really obvious, like I might give you a patient who I say they, they use you know, their rescue inhaler several times a day, that should be a clue that they have severe asthma. So I don't really want you to know all the details here, but be able to recognize like the difference between a severe and well-controlled patient. Um, we aren't going to test on kids at all, so I'm not going to approach that. It's very similar to the adults, so if you want to compare it, certainly go ahead. Um, kids, kids, kids. Uh, teens and adults, the step is very straightforward. I think asthma is pretty easy to treat as far as knowing how to do it. Once you have understand the classes of drugs, it's not too complicated. Um, for intermittent asthma patients, you don't need to be on any control or, control or medication. All you need is a rescue inhaler. You've got your rescue inhaler here. Keep it with you. You've got it as needed. If you need it, you need it. If you don't, good. Um, the next step, if you have any type of persistent symptoms, is to start somebody on a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. That's ICS abbreviated there. The alternate treatment, I wouldn't worry about these too much. Chromalin, um, leukotriene receptor antagonist is that abbreviation there, so that would be like starting singular. Um, that would be a patient, I could think maybe like a patient who's really resistant to an inhaler. Like for some reason they just have no interest in using their inhaler, or they're poorly compliant, their asthma is mostly under control, but they have some occasional symptoms. Maybe you go ahead and try an oral med first and see if that works for them. Or if they failed the inhaler, try the oral med. That would be the situation. I'd see that alternate therapy coming into play. And then you step up from there. So you add on. First thing you're usually going to add on is a long-acting beta agonist. So with respect to asthma, um, the question came up about anticholinergic use and which one is preferred. And asthma, remember, anticholinergics weren't really used all that much. And there wasn't a lot of evidence for them. They were originally studied in COPD to get approved to the market. And that's where they were used for a long time. So we don't necessarily have as much data to support that they work. However, from a, I don't know, a logical point of view and from a pharmacologic point of view, they certainly make sense that they'd work. So I'll show you where the GINA guidelines slot them in. But um, these guidelines and the, the, the body of evidence we have to treat asthma supports that you add the long-acting beta agonist first before you'd add an anticholinergic agent. In fact, these guidelines I said are a little bit older. You don't even have anticholinergics on, and I'll show you where those fit in here in a second. Um, but the point is, is that most patients who have some sort of persistent asthma falling in that mild to moderate category are probably going to get a combination low-dose inhaled corticosteroid plus long-acting beta agonist. So that takes you back to that slide that I showed you with Advair and Dulera and all those other drugs like that that are super popular. Um, after that, you can increase your dose of corticosteroid. This is an interesting point that I didn't mention earlier, but the, when it comes to inhalers, if you have three different Advair, so all three strengths of Advair, the difference is the long-acting beta agonist. The corticosteroid amount is consistent throughout all three strengths. That doesn't change. And that's the same with um, Brio products and any other product. That corticosteroid is stable, and then you're increasing your, um, uh, sorry, Long-acting beta agonist is stable, and you're increasing your corticosteroid. That's what I meant to say, like it says on here. So you can't change the dose of your long-acting beta agonist is what I'm getting at, but you can increase your steroid dose. So start with the lowest dose available. Most of them come in two doses, so like Brio products come in two, Dulera and Simbicort both come in two, and then Advair comes in three. So those are your options. Usually it's low or high dose. You don't necessarily have the medium one, but with Advair you do have a medium dose option. Um, if you did have the option, so let's say you started them on step four, so you increased their steroid dose, depending on what product they're on, that might be the highest you can go. So like let's say you started them on 
Rio, Flutica is on 100 micrograms, and then you up them in step four to the 200 micrograms, you can't go to 300, it doesn't exist. If you had Advair, again, you could go up one more there. So if you hit step five and you're all out of in inhaled corticosteroid at that point, then you're going to consider other options. So here they recommend um, the, uh, the Zolaire product and then possibly oral corticosteroids. But don't kind of cut yourself off here for these guidelines because this stuff changes on the next slide I'm going to show you here. This is Gina from 2015. I didn't update the slide because I looked at the 2018s last night and it really hasn't changed at all. It's very slightly different, but it's basically the exact same thing here. Um, and what they've got differently here is other controller options. And you'll notice on step four, they have teotropium uh, add-on here. So you could replace teotropium with any anticholinergic product on here. It doesn't have to be teotropium. It could be um, eumethodinium or whatever other ones are available. And then, um, and then they, so they basically slot that in as a triple therapy inhaler before they get to the anti-IgE therapy. Um, they also recommend things like adding the, and don't forget about the um, leukotrienes too. If you've maxed your inhalers out, maybe that's the time. If you didn't start with that or didn't add that on earlier, you could try and add something like Montelukast on. So that's generally the approach. Usually we're going to start with respiratory meds that get directly to the pulmonary tissues, and then we're going to go on and progress from there, max those out. Uh, always, always make sure your inhaler compliance is, uh, is perfect. Patients should be using it ap appropriately. Um, if they aren't, that's something certainly to make an intervention on. Um, and then make sure they can afford their inhaler. If they can't afford it, they can't take it, right? So those are things to make sure too. But if everything's good, um, you should be able to manage them with the different respiratory meds. And then hopefully you don't have to actually get to the point where you're adding on a low-dose oral corticosteroid daily. That would be very odd for an asthma patient, but I suppose it's possible. Um, Exercise-induced asthma, a.k.a. bronchoconstriction. Um, some people are more likely to get this than others, and certainly you can have patients who have never had asthma, and they might experience something kind of like an exercise-induced asthma exacerbation. That's just really a short-term exacerbation. What more talking about here is people who are like an acute on chronic asthma, like they might have an intermittent asthma that's mostly well controlled, but they do get occasional exercise induced. There's a couple things we can do. Um, beta agonists, so prophylaxis with albuterol or for formoterol have both been studied 10 minutes prior to exercise. I think it depends on how long you're going to go. If you have somebody who's running a marathon, maybe you think of a longer acting one than there, so they aren't puffing on their albuterol the whole time. Um, tolerance to long-acting agents can build up over time, so um, if you can keep it to a short-acting agent for short amounts of exercise, that's probably preferred, but again, if somebody's exercising for a really long period of time, you could maybe consider something longer-acting. Steroids are only really useful if, poorly, if asthma is really poor, poorly controlled, and um, they require quite a few weeks to months for improvements. So remember, inhaled cortical steroids for intermittent exercise-induced asthma are really not going to be of benefit to patients. And same thing with oral corticosteroids. There just wouldn't be a role for them really in this. Um, interestingly enough, there is a, some evidence that anti-leukotriene agents, when taken two hours prior to, uh, to exercise, have some effect for a single dose. So you could use those as needed. I think the most popular thing is just to give somebody an albuterol inhaler and have them make sure they use that before they exercise. So. Pretty straightforward there. I've talked about exacerbations here. This just goes through some of the treatment as far as what you would do in a real life situation. So albuterol, apotropium, eight to, uh, four to eight puffs every 20 minutes for up to four hours. So you could see somebody could use a lot of albuterol in a small amount of time, and that's okay. They're just remember to educate people that if they do get that exacerbation, they can go a lot higher than just if they feel you know a little bit of shortness of breath coming on, so that they know the difference between that. Nebulization, we talked about that. Um, oxygen, IV access, we use IV or IM methylprednisolone for most patients in an acute asthma exacerbation if, if it's acute enough that we don't want to give them oral. Yeah. Is there no sensitization to it? So if you do it over and over and over and over, it's still going to work every time? Most of the time. So you, you do lose some efficacy on the ipratropium side, but albuterol can really be given almost continuously with good effects. I don't know if you could do it for days and days and days, but people do take it round the clock. So it's just like, think about it like uh, replacing, taking a long-acting beta agonist and replacing it with four times a day dosed albuterol. It's still going to give you the same effects, just less convenient, whereas the long-acting round the clock. And that's kind of what you're doing here. You're just giving them a big burst of beta agonist that works uh, longer term. 
Uh, magnesium sulfate, we'll talk about this during some other things, but magnesium, when you give it IV, uh, you guys are like, why are we talking about magnesium? Uh, don't worry about it for an exam point of view. We'll talk about it a couple other times. Magnesium basically has smooth muscle relaxation properties. It's used for other things like um, preeclampsia um, for pregnant patients, too. We'll talk about it during OB a lot. Uh, but it actually has a good role in asthma exacerbation. So you can give a two gram load of magnesium sulfate and you can give it over about 20 minutes. It's very safe for the most part. There's not really any side effects. You, your body can tolerate a big bump of magnesium with very little effect. Your, your kidneys will pee it out. Um, and if you have like a severe exacerbation, you've tried everything up until that point, that would be the, the drug to go to. Um, allergic responses should be managed appropriately at the same time. So if somebody is anaphylactic or they're having a really severe allergy to something and they're having an asthma exacerbation because of that, just keep that into consideration and think about what we talked about with antihistamines um, and uh, those type of things. We, I won't talk about anaphylaxis or anything like that um, on this exam as far as the treatment. We'll come back to it during emergency medicine. Uh, we talked about IV methylxanthine, so like IV theophylline, that's a possibility. Controversial, not necessarily that well studied, and it's last line. That's all I really care about, you know. The goal here is to prevent intubating the patient. Ultimately, if somebody's not responding to any of these things, we can put a tube down and uh, breathe for them. That's the last resort. We don't want to do that if we can avoid it. Then you have to sedate the patient. Um, you have to paralyze them briefly. You have to continue sedation. They're probably going to be in that. They're, they're going to be in the ICU for a couple of days at least. So it's a lot of stuff to do for an asthma exacerbation. When if you manage them correctly, I've never intubated an asthmatic patient or seen them intubated. You can do it quickly and correctly. You can get them under control very quickly. So good respiratory therapist in the room is a godsend. I'll throw that out there for them. All right. Uh, any questions about asthma before we move on to COPD? Okay, um, COPD, uh, COPD, excuse me, is very, very common adult chronic condition, affects more than 5% of the population in the U.S., high morbidity and mortality, third rank cause of death in the United States, a lot of resources from frequent clinic and hospitalizations to uh, chronic medications and oxygen therapy use uh, causes. Possibly uh, some things here like reduced lung growth, premature lung function decline, inflammation, but a different mechanism than asthma. Those would be the rare ones. The big ones bolded. Cigarette smoking is highly correlated with COPD, and the fact that we have such a huge amount of the patient population has COPD is very linked to the number of people that smoke. Um, so there is data out there that most, I think that people that smoke, I think like 50% of them will end up with some form of fairly significant COPD, which kind of baffles me because I feel like everyone who smokes regularly would probably get to some point after they ruin their lungs that way, but I guess you just never know. Some people seem to tolerate it better than others. Um, this shows pulmonary function tests with COPD patients and age. So you can see A would be a normal patient who Generally, like if you averaged everyone out, how your lung function progresses over time, it just gets a little bit worse as you get older. And then curve B shows reduced lung growth. So this would be somebody who maybe has some um, lung function issues uh, from when they were a child. They just didn't develop correctly. So again, a little bit of a, uh, a uh, downslope here, same thing. And then and then you see the, the decline in lung function that if you were um, with COPD. And, <clears throat> and also this shows also some, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just reading this because I want to make sure I'm saying it right. A premature decline in lung function. So that'd be basically like if you started smoking, you usually aren't going to see lung function decline at age 20. You're going to see it a little bit later, but slowly you're going to separate from your peers out to the point where you have significantly worse lung function than your peers. And then um, lungs can recover, so you can kind of stabilize this if you stop smoking and get back on track, but uh, that's just something to show as far as pulmonary tests go. Um, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is very similar in its treatment to asthma. So the reason I show you this weird Zen diagram thing is that everything kind of relates together from bronchitis to emphysema to COPD. It's all sort of related to airflow obstruction to some degree. So pathophysiologically, yes, they're different, but um, for the purposes of our discussion, they're really treated very similarly with one, maybe two major differences that we'll get to here in a second. The symptoms are going to be different, and what we target and what our goals of treatment are going to be different, though. So most common symptoms, dyspnea, chronic cough, and sputum production, and wheezing and chest tightness being less common. Presentation, patients usually have a sedentary lifestyle. Um, they might not be unaware of their limitations. COPD is 
creeps up on people and they might not know until all of a sudden they just feel really shortness of breath and they can't get out of their house or they can't get up off the couch as easily as they could or they can't get out of bed in the morning and it might just that might con compound the effects right so if you aren't able to be active as much you get more sedentary and then it's sort of a vicious cycle that way um, respiratory symptoms initially only on exertion eventually noticeable at rest too um, confused diagnosis so a COPD patient could look infectious it could look like they have a pneumonia could look like they have a heart failure exacerbation too those are all very similar presentations so diagnostically that's your guys job to tease that out but um, I'll just throw that out there goal of therapy uh, preserve respiratory function via pharmacologic therapy and non-pharmacologic therapy so smoking cessation is key reducing other risk factors if there's other exposures that possibly are contributing which would be rare uh, vaccination so influenza and pneumococcal shots are key for copd ears to keep them um, from getting those comorbid infections <clears throat> comorbid pneumonias oxygen therapy might be necessary for some patients pulmonary rehabilitation is something that could be considered for probably any stage patient and or at least refer them to a respiratory therapist we're not going to hurt them the gold guidelines are the COPD published guidelines, and they come out with different updates every year. It hasn't changed a lot in the last couple of years. This is an older diagram. You can see it's from March 2010, but I like the colors and the way it's laid out, so I've kept it in here. And then I've got some of the newer stuff on the next slides. But mild, moderate, severe, very severe. It's a simple way to look at it. They actually classify it a little bit differently now as categories A, B, C, and D. Um, but just think about that as a general terminology, and it shows you your pulmonary function testing. Uh, what type of uh, active risk factors you should include. And then um, short-acting bronchodilator is going to be useful for every patient of any severity level. You're going to add on your long-acting bronchodilator, which would either be a short act, or excuse me, would either be a long-acting beta agonist or an anticholinergic med. Um, and then you're going to add your inhaled corticosteroid. So if you're paying attention to the last set of slides, it's opposite asthma, right? You start with the other one. So you're starting with your bronchodilator, then adding your steroid on asthma. You start with the steroid and then add your bronchodilator. That's really the biggest difference with COPD treatment. Otherwise, it's very, very similar. Um, okay, let's talk about the actual uh, way the gold guidelines classify things now. So A, B, C, and D has to do with pulmonary function testing and symptoms, which I'm not going to get into, but you can see the higher in the alphabet, you have worse symptoms, right? So depending on where your symptoms lie, that's where gold's going to recommend. Oh, yeah. All right. That's so that's asthmatic patients, not COPD oh, okay. patients. Yeah, yeah. 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 Specifically yeah. a subset with asthma patients. Okay. Yep. Usually usually they start, I think majority of people will start with an anticholinergic over the lava, but there's no real evidence to say that's better than than the other way around. So you could do either one monotherapy for a COPD patient. Uh, and we'll, I'll talk about some of that evidence here in a second. So depending on your category, you've got, this looks, this should look very similar, really similar to that chart I showed you, but it's a little bit more detailed. So you have your first choices here, which is really what I'm most concerned about. Um, short acting products, first and foremost, in category A. You're going to start on with either your long acting anticholinergic or your beta agonist. Both are approved first line for guideline as monotherapy, so you could really choose either one. Um, C, inhaled corticosteroid plus your long acting, whichever one you chose. And then D would be triple therapy, so that's really all there is to it. Um, there's, of course, some alternate choices here. Um, they talk about uh, PDE4 inhibitors, which I'll mention, which would be, uh, which well, I'll mention that here in a second. And there's some other odd treatments here, uh, like they put theophylline. I talked about people taking oral theophylline. Um, that's a more unusual therapy, but a, again, an option for people who have tried all this stuff and not doing that great with it. This just uh, guy does a little bit of a, I don't know, not. It's not a table, what I'm trying to say, bullet point format, there we go, um, of what I just said. So nothing really different here. Uh, oxygen therapy for more severe patients, then you're going on to, to more complicated treatments out there. But it's basically the same as the table I just showed you here. Okay, so which long-acting bronchodilator is better? Uh, both appear effective. There's conflicting evidence over which may be better. Shocking. Uh, largest trial shows teotropium was more effective than selmeterol. Uh, that, that is one of the biggest trials out there. So that's why um, this was published in the New, New England Journal in 2011. It increased um, 
time to first exacerbation. So people who were on Teotropium versus Sulmeterol had more time without an exacerbation. That was one of the metrics they looked at. And then uh, reduced risk of developing exacerbation by 17%. However, there's another trial in American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine that showed Indicaterol was as effective as Teotropium. And that was another fairly large, well-done trial. So the evidence is conflicting, but I think based on New England Journal's weight that a lot of people will prescribe an anticholinergic as first line because they think the evidence favors it. I don't disagree with that, and I don't have any problem with that. I think that's a fine way to look at it. Um, is it technically guidelines? No, the guidelines say you could do either one. So the guidelines have said the body of evidence doesn't recommend one over the other. But um, there are some trials that might lean you one way or the other. If you want to look into it on your own and make your own, feel free to get on PubMed and, and see what you can find. But that's the, that's the gist of it. Um, treatment. So why is the glucocorticoid used secondary to bronchodilators? So why is it flipped of asthma? Um, shown to decrease exacerbations and slow progressions of respiratory symptoms, but it really doesn't have any impact on lung function or mortality. So people get symptomatic relief from these, but it doesn't help the lungs restore function and uh, it doesn't improve overall mortality. So there are big markers we're looking at when we're studying things like this, right? Um, and again, uh, not to be used as monotherapy in COPD. So just like we don't use beta agonists as monotherapy in asthma, we don't use glucocorticoids as monotherapy in COPD. So again, it's flipped. Glucocorticoid combination with long-acting beta agonists, um, gold stage 3 to 4, a.k.a. patient groups C and D, reduction in mild to moderate to severe exacerbations. Good evidence to support that, that combination is fairly effective in COPD patients. Hence the popularity of Advair. Uh, all right, treatment. Uh, triple therapy, let's talk about this just a little bit more. There is some evidence to support triple therapy. One of the best trials out there was done in 2008 that tested uh, two-thirds of the patients with long-acting beta agonist plus a long-acting muscarinic. So it's kind of interesting that they chose one of their arms to be both bronchodilators and not a bronchodilator plus an inhaled corticosteroid because that's not really how the guidelines would drive your treatment. In normal life, you would probably have LABA slash LAMA plus ICS. But anyway, they did the triple therapy and found that it significantly improved airflows, reduced exacerbations, and improved quality of life, uh, but did not reduce uh, the decline in FEV1. So it actually didn't improve pulmonary function tests over time. Other trials have shown similar results from what I can find. So the question is, what benefit do you really get out of it? It'd be great um, if maybe they didn't particularly want to put it up against an inhaled corticosteroid because they figured the results wouldn't be as impressive. Remember, inhaled corticosteroids do give a lot of those quality of life benefits, and that's kind of what they're showing here, but not the pulmonary function improvements, which again is what they're showing. So triple therapy is approved in the guidelines. It certainly makes sense pharmacologically, but I wouldn't expect you know your patient to magically all of a sudden get way better because they're on one extra inhaler. Uh, you might get marginal benefits at best. You might get some quality of life improvements and feel better, which is great, but it might not improve their overall disease uh, picture. So just know that, um, but it's certainly, again, a guideline recommended option, definitely something we can use in our arsenal. And it comes as one inhaler now, which is pretty cool for compliance. Okay, refractory COPD. Um, theophylline, I mentioned this a couple times. You can do a low oral dose. There's a lot of different metabolic hepatic interactions with this, so just that's all I really care about you knowing. If you're going to prescribe oral theophylline, know that it has drug interactions uh, and watch out with liver failure because it is hepatically metabolized. Most people with oral dose theophylline don't have terrible side effects with it, but if they do have hepatic issues with metabolism, it can accumulate faster and therefore get more toxic easily. PDE4 inhibitor. So PDE is an abbreviation for phosphodiesterase. There's a lot of different phosphodiesterase enzymes and a lot of drugs that inhibit different ones. So as an example, PDE5 inhibitors are drugs that everyone in here has probably heard of, like Viagra and Cialis. Those are PDE5 inhibitors, and they improve blood flow in certain areas of the body. Um, PDE4 inhibitors, in this case, uh, roflumilas, excuse me, or Dalaresp, is a 500 microgram once daily drug that inhibits the specific PDE subtype 4 um, that reduces activity of certain immune cells. So very different functions. We'll talk about um, Viagra and all that great stuff during the men's health lecture in, in a few months here. But the point is, is that PDE, if you ever hear, if I ever talk about PDE inhibitors, they're um, all different as far as where their functions go. So it's not like they're one class. Depends greatly on what that number is. And this one's specifically for. Uh, it does show an improvement in FEV1. It's kind of an expensive drug. It's an oral medication that's once daily, but it is pricey. Um, but again, improved FEV1 prevents exacerbations. 
And actually, people didn't report a lot of quality of life effects, so kind of the opposite of an inhaled corticosteroid. So if you got your triple therapy on board, but your FEV1 is still declining, maybe this is the drug to add on if the patient seems to be doing okay, all other things considered. Ultimately, you can try things like lung reduction surgery, lung transplants, and that's more advanced than what I'm going to talk about here, but other options to consider. Exacerbations, acute increase in symptoms beyond baseline, just like any exacerbation would be, and those are, would be, again, our symptoms we're looking at. 70 to 80% by respiratory infections, that's the biggest cause here. Usually it's viral, um, but certainly you can have viral that causes a bacterial pneumonia, or the bacterial pneumonia lives alongside of the viral infection, or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, rhinoviruses, influenza, things like that. So making sure we can prevent as much as possible. Flu shot, uh, pneumococcal vaccine are the big things here. And then treat the infection as you would normally. So um, if it's a full-blown pneumonia, treat it like a pneumonia. If it's a, a more COPD exacerbation, mini pneumonia, we talked about that during ID. So I'm not going to go over that or test you on that again. Um, steroids also, we talked about that a few slides ago and what dose you would do, but short bursts of steroids would be indicated for a COPD exacerbation as well. I hope and I go on more about this. Well, anyway, there's that. Um, I'm not going to test you on diagnostics or anything like that. And this is just what I said here as far as antibiotics, um, short-acting beta agonists, glucocorticoids, pretty much the same case as asthma. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about COPD or asthma?